This true story has been taken from the recollections written down by Ben Bailey, one of Dill's old boatmen and lifeboatmen. I have spoken the words as if I were him, and I hope you enjoy listening to one of Ben's true life experiences. I'd also like to thank his daughter Coral for allowing his memoirs to be revived. The war in Europe had finished, and I was back at Lowestoft, which was the base of the Royal Naval Patrol Service. We had been given a few days of leave for victory over Japan. Eager to go home, I went to the train station and managed to get a train ticket back home to Deal and hopefully enjoy a few days of well-earned leave. Back home at Deal, my father had managed to get our motorboat, the Lady Irene, back on the beach ready for use for her summer tripping season next year. People were slowly beginning to venture out and take holidays again. It was the afternoon of August the 25th, 1945, when I arrived at Dill Station, and not having been home for some time, decided to go out in the evening and meet up with several of my old mates that I hadn't seen for a number of years. We had a great time, but I must say I put away too much beer, but the night was one to remember. I wasn't feeling too good the next morning, so I decided to go and have a look over the beach. I was just crossing the road when there was a loud bang followed by another loud bang. Nobody seemed to know what it was. The two bangs turned out to be the Maroons. I believe this was the first time they had been used since before the war had started. All through the war there had been a permanent crew ready for emergencies, but now the lifeboat was back on a peacetime footing, with belts reserved for the coxswain and second coxswain, the first and second mechanic, the bellman and signalman, leaving the remaining four belts available for people who were on the crew list. I looked out to sea, in a direction roughly due east of the Royal Hotel. The visibility was clear, and what looked like a three-masted ship seemed to be hard and fast aground on the eastern edge of the Goodwin Sands, just south of the Kellett Cup. Summing up the situation, I didn't think it was any good going to Warmer to man the lifeboat, so I asked my old man what he was going to do. He wasn't really interested, as he'd been afloat all night, and he had just come ashore with a lot of fish in his boat. Looking over to the Royal Hotel, I noticed Fred Roberts was standing by the Golden Spray. Her sails were aboard, and as always, she was ready for launching. By this time, Jock Kennedy, Alf May and some of the other lads had arrived on the beach, and were looking seawards towards the Goodwins where the vessel was aground. I ventured over to the Golden Spray, and joining them we discussed the situation and decided to launch. We were about half a mile out when we saw the warmer lifeboat starting to run down the beach. They had also decided to launch to go to the aid of the casualty, so we knew we were now in a race to see who could get to the vessel first. But to our surprise, the lifeboat stopped and got stuck in the soft beach, just short of the sea whilst attempting a launch. This would cause a couple of hours delay for the lifeboat, as she would have to be hauled up and prepared for launch again, giving us plenty of time to reach the grounded vessel. It took us nearly an hour to reach the schooner, which proved to be the Elsie, a brand new vessel loaded with timber. Jock Kennedy and myself went aboard her and asked about putting out a kedge anchor. I thought it would be a better idea to drop one of the ship's own anchors. This would make it easier to refloat her. We managed to do this just before the tide turned. The incoming tide was flowing quite fast and a stiff breeze was now blowing from the northeast. The schooner at this time was lying with her head pointed south. There was now a terrific tide flowing and the vessel was being forced further on the sandbank and was being rolled and rocked about by the heavy seas which were now starting to break around her. As the tide rose the swell slowly rocked the vessel from side to side. We gradually paid out a bit more cable. Slowly the ship moved closer to the deep water. Then suddenly a huge swell broke right over her. She lurched heavily, then sliding along the sandbank stood upright in slightly deeper water, but she wasn't out of danger yet. She still had some distance to go before she was clear of the sands. I looked over the side and saw Charlie Williams pinned to the seat of the boat by his legs with the rope they had made us fast with. Jock and I quickly jumped down into the boat and managed to release him. Then we quickly climbed back on board the ship and found the mate, who was operating the windlass. He was putting all his effort into preventing the chain from slackening. We now had the perfect hedge anchor out from the bows of the ship. All we had to do was wait for a short while longer for enough water to float her. While we had been busy getting the hedge anchor out and preparing the ship for refloating, 
the warmer lifeboat arrived on the scene. She also put her rope aboard, and it wasn't long, with the help of the ship's engine and the winch heaving on the kedge anchor, and with the help of our motor boats, that we had her afloat and clear of the sands. Another good day's work in the life of the dual boatman. Thank you.